Dr. Judith S. Weiss is a professor emerita of biological sciences at Rutgers University, Newark. She received her bachelor's degree from Cornell and MS and PhD from NYU. Her research focuses on estuarine ecology and ecotoxicology, and she has published over 200 refereed science, scientific papers, as well as books on salt marshes, salt marshes, a natural and unnatural history, fish, do fish sleep, crabs, walking sideways, the remarkable world of crabs, and marine pollution, marine pollution, what everyone needs to know. These were published for the general public and co-edited uh, and she co-edited a more technical book on biological invasions and animal behavior. She is interested in stresses in estuaries and their effects on organisms, populations, and communities. Much of Judith's research has been in the NY and New Jersey harbor area, but she has also done research in Indonesia and Madagascar. She's on the editorial board for Bioscience, is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and was a Fulbright Senior Specialist in Indonesia. She has been on advisory committees for USIPA, NOAA, and the NAS, and currently chairs the Science Advisory Board of NJDEP, co-chairs the Science and Technical Advisory Committee for the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary, and serves on the Waterfront Management Advisory Board of New York City. She chaired the biology section of AAAS, served on the board of CTAC, the Association for Women in Sciences, and the American Institute of Biological Sciences, of which she was the president in 2001. She received the Merit Award from the Society of Wetland Scientists in 2016. Please welcome Judith Weiss. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Judith Weiss. I'm a, a emeritus professor. That means I'm retired but still very busy, just not getting paid, uh, from Rutgers University. And I wanted to talk to you about a paper that was just brought to my notice um, this past year uh, by an organization called Academia. And they wrote me to asked me if I was interested in writing a commentary on a paper that was called Shell Use by Juvenile Fiddler Crafts, Yucca Pugnax, and Yucca Pugilator. And I had missed that paper when it first came out, it was 10 years ago, and somehow I hadn't, I hadn't seen it. And I found it really interesting, and since it is talking about possible relationships uh, fiddler crafts with hermit crafts, I thought it might be of interest to you too. Um, in my commentary, I first started to talk about how do crafts or other kinds of uh, crustaceans protect themselves. I mean, the most important thing for staying alive for most of these animals is not getting eaten by a predator. Um, and there are various ways that crafts protect themselves. Crabs that are big enough, uh, kind of like this blue crab here, pretty fearsome with the claws stuck out like that. That would be a pretty good physical deterrent to a predator to get pinched by those big, strong claws is, is, is pretty good protection for that blue crab. Um, but a small crab using that te same technique is not likely to be successful. I mean, if this, oh, can you see my pointer, by the way, when I, is it visible? Well, I hope it is. Anyway, um, a small crab that's just been grabbed by a larger one, that small crab is going to be dinner, uh, regardless of whether that small crab made this claws out display. Uh, it's not going to be effective when a predator is significantly bigger than you. So the uh, best strategy for a small crab is really to hide. Uh, it's, you're much, likely, much less likely to get eaten if you hide well than if you stand there with your claws out. When a crab gets grabbed by a predator, they have the ability 
to break off if they get grabbed, grabbed by a leg. If the predator grabs them by the main part of the body, by the carapace, this doesn't work. But if they get grabbed by a leg, like here, this seagull or this heron, um, here's a picture of, of a heron. Here's a little fiddler crab sticking its claw out. You know, it's not going to be really very effective sticking the claw out against a, a bird like that. Um, so what they do, what they can do is break off, we call this autotomy, break off the claw or lid, leaving the predator with just the appendage, and uh, the crab then can scuttle away minus a leg or two or a claw or two. Uh, the breaking off is done in such a way that it doesn't cause injury or bleeding or anything because there is a breakage plane, a kind of membrane near the base of the, of the limb where it breaks off. Um, and so that it's not, it's not that causing damage. It's, it's a preformed plane that's there. Um, and once the leg is gone and you see every now and then you'll find legs like this, crab legs on beaches, um, and can then regenerate it. Um, the crab limb regeneration, you see the breakage plane is here. It's not at the very base of the claw, in this case the claw. Um, it's it's one, one joint up is where that breakage plane is. So it would look like this initially. And then here you may be able to see partly regenerated limb here on this one. And then here it, it shows this is more advanced. This is, is, you can see that it's bent over. It's developed its bent shape. So it's the, the limb bud called is growing folded and it's covered by a thin layer of cuticle. And it's only when the crab molts that the uh, new limb, which won't be full size yet, it will take a couple of molts before it gets to be full size, but it, it will become a functional claw, though small, um, when this animal molts. So it is possible to, to survive and regenerate lead. Um, it takes a lot of energy. And it does reduce the amount of overall body growth during this period. All the growth is going into replacing the new limbs. Uh, so all in all, it's better to hide. If you have a choice of losing a leg or hiding, and so you won't lose the leg, it's probably better to hide. Uh, for fiddle crabs, burrows is the major self-protection. Uh, they hide. They dig burrows. In the, in the mud or sand, as you see in these various pictures. Burrows are also used for mating and molting. Uh, when they molt, it's really good to be by yourself in your burrow because after molting, the crab is soft for a period of time and extremely vulnerable to predators. So it's, it's particularly important to hide in the burrow after molting. But again, uh, in the burrow, those birds are not likely to be able to catch the crab in a burrow. Juvenile, little ones that are like meters and carapace with four and two, you know, those teeny weeny, newly metamorphosed juveniles. Are not and their claws are not strong enough to be able to dig their own burrows, and uh, so you tend to find them sharing bigger burrows of their larger, um, or larger fiddlers, or sometimes in the substrate, you know, by in the marsh grasses uh, or algal mats, they can hide under there and be pretty well protected. And that's uh, how where I have seen them. But then in this paper that was pointed out to me last year, uh, a paper from 2010, it talked about shell use by juvenile fiddler crabs and then two species 
that are the common and most common species on the Atlantic coast of the U.S., Yucca pugnax and Yucca pugilator. And, and this paper reported that they were in Georgia marshes, found juveniles, these three to four millimeter little ones, uh, of both species living in shells of periwinkle snails. And this is not a good figure. Uh, this is from Sophie George, who was the first author of this paper. Uh, but they're showing peri open periwinkle snails. And if it were clearer, you might be able to see something in here or in here, which represents juvenile fiddler crab hanging out. Um, I can't see it very well. I doubt that you can, but this is the picture that she provided. So, and along with many charts and lots of data uh, of, of, you know, the size and the months of the year and the locations in Georgia marshes where they found these things. Uh, so I thought that was a really interesting paper. Um, the, when I see an empty snail shell in where, where I live and other places I've been, empty snail shell is generally not empty. It generally is occupied by a hermit crab. And the common one that occupies these small uh, periwinkle snail shells is called Pagoras longicarpus. And that's the hermit crab that's most abundant where I, in places where I've been. And so I was thinking, what's happened? And I have never seen a fiddler crab juvenile in one of these shells, never in, you know, 40, 40 50 years of doing, you know, hanging around in, in marshes and beaches. Uh, so I, my first thing I thought about is perhaps hermit crabs are very rare in the beaches, beaches where, um, these, where, where Sophie George did the work. So I don't know that if the hermit crabs are very rare there, therefore the shells are available for the juvenile fiddler crabs. If the hermit crabs are not very rare in Georgia beaches, then the next question is, are the hermit crabs and fiddler crabs competing for these shells? And the answer to that is, I have no idea. And that's all I have to say. It's a very short, short talk. I hope to stimulate some discussion and conversation uh, from you. Uh, maybe somebody, somebody here from, um, or somebody knows. Uh, I done, uh, and I'm looking for the chat box to see any chat questions. I see. Somebody said, oh, Mary, Alex. That sounds familiar. Fascinating. Interesting. Did you find uh, the chat? I, yeah, I found it. Kelly Elder, I'm also from the Mid-Atlantic. I spent a ton of time on it. Fiddler crab, a local term for oil crabs. Fiddler crabs are small, box-shaped. Let me get back a picture. There's all kinds of green yeah. uh, Let's see. Your screen back. share is still up, so you should be able to just go back in your slides. Um, it's not up for me. I'm going to have to stop sharing and start it again or something. Okay, hold, okay. On. hold on. Um, okay, I need to go backwards. Fiddler crabs look like this. The males have 
one large claw that they wave around for attracting females. The females have two little claws like this. They're boxy, they're small, they're about one inch across, and they live in tidally in, various, in beaches and marshes. They dig in burrows, uh, and they are um, there are several different species, but they they are never getting very large. So foot crabs are a very specific uh, group of crabs, uh, and they're named fiddler crab because of the male when the male waves the claw. I guess somebody thought it looked like a fiddle. But you know there are thousands of other kinds of crabs that live in all different kinds of habitats. Uh, you know, from the deep ocean to shallow ocean to fresh water to up in trees. I mean, crabs live all over the place. And fiddler crabs are a particular group of, uh, I would guess, over a hundred uh, different species that all live in the. I'm sorry if you're hearing a lot of noise. It's my parrot um, who is joining the conversation here. Sorry about that. Anyway, so that's that's the answer to that question. Fiddlers are not um, just the name of everything that's not a hermit crab. It's a very crab. Okay, so then I am back here. Let's see, where are we? Fiddler crabs. Um, Well, let's see, let me go back. Okay, so that's the, the answer to Kelly. So I think this is adaptive behavior. I think the juvenile fishes that are too weak, too small, too big a borrow will hide in anything they can find. And if there's a bunch of empty periwinkle snail shells around, um, they'll take, they'll go there, and, and they obviously did that a lot in the Georgia beaches that um, this uh, Sophie Georgia and her workers went, went to. So it, it's, I think, you know, they'll hide wherever they can find a place. If there's, if there's plastic litter on the beach, they'll probably hide in that too. All right, so blue crabs are definitely not fiddlers. Ghost crabs are also not fiddlers, but they are rel relatives. Uh, this is to Kelly uh, Eider. Um, ghost crabs are relatives of the fiddlers. They also dig burrows. They're also kind of box shaped, but they don't have. Um, fiddler crabs tend to not live in ocean beaches, whereas the uh, ghost crabs do. And uh, ghost crabs lack the enlarged claw of the male. Uh, they lack the be some of the behaviors that fiddler crabs have. They have different behaviors. Ghost crabs are, are, are some of the fastest moving crabs possible to catch when they're running down a beach. So they are, but they're rel rel closer to relatives because they are in the same group. Okay, Michael, I was in Jekyll Island a couple of years ago and noticed a large amount of snails all over. Lots of marine hermits as well. Didn't notice fiddler crabs, but they were most likely away from the main beaches. Yeah, you won't find um, fiddlers on an ocean beach. They'll be at bay beaches and, and beaches where there is not major surf, uh, where, where you could find the ghost crabs. Okay, Denise, do filler crabs not require the extreme heat as hermits? So you're talking about land hermits because the hermits that are potentially maybe competing with filler crabs are not land hermits. They are uh, the, the hermit crabs that are in the, in the shallow water rather than up on land. Fiddler crab and, and, and the aquatic hermit crabs, and, and these are shallow water hermit crabs and shallow water fiddlers, do not need 
extreme heat, um, and they probably not like it very much at all. Uh, I think on an extremely hot day, the fiddlers are more likely to hang out down in their burrows where it's cooler. But they do need they do need the uh, they can live out of the water for some time, not like your land hermits, but that these are not really land crabs. They are semi call them semi terrestrial. They're part they're they're out of the water can't get dry. Uh, okay. Kelly, that makes total sense now. Okay. Jean, I was in Jamestown, Virginia, and saw wild fiddlers hundreds. Yes, they, they will uh, they will swarm down as the tide goes out. They will and then in thousands, hundreds of thousands of them. Um, did I miss something? Okay, that was Jekyll Island. This is an extreme heat. Da, da, da. All right, Brackish Beach along the James River. Yes, that's exactly the typical fiddler crab habitat. Yeah, that and my bird shut up for a while. I don't know. She's gone. She's probably destroying the house. I may need to take away to, to get away from a beach for a couple of seconds. Um, <laughs> to go find her. She's left her own device that she would turn the house into splinters. Um, okay, we see a lot of them in Delaware. Okay. Um, marine crabs. Oh, okay. Are the fiddlers being short on habitat and forced to use shells as protection? I think normally, the juvenile fiddlers, I can't say, normally is not a good word because well, I'm, I'm mostly used to uh, mid-Atlantic. So I, I think the fiddlers are, are not running out of habitat and they're not used, forced to use shells because when you get juveniles, that means you've got adults there and there are adult burrows and it means there's a marsh there and the marsh is giving them a place to be protected, hiding among grasses, hiding in algal mats and stuff. I don't think they're running out of habitat. I'm concerned with what will happen in the future, though, if in areas where we're going to lose our marshes to sea level rise. Uh, that's another thing to talk about. It's, it's, uh, I'm very concerned that uh, marshes in the Mid-Atlantic and, and New England, which are nowhere near as extensive as marshes in the South. Uh, a, a lot of the marshes that we've studied in New Jersey and that other people have studied in New York and Long Island, uh, as, as the sea level is rising, a marsh has got to do one of two things. A marsh has got to either increase its elevation or move inland up the slope or else the marsh is going to drown and there'll be no marsh and then there will be no habitat. This woman and I, the bird is busy destroying something. I will be animated. Come here. No worries, we'll get your bird. Come here. Come here. Come here. Okay. I'm back. Uh, so I don't think they're running short of habitat yet. If the marshes uh, in the next 50 to 100 years, if many marshes disappear, then the fiddler crabs will be out of habitat. The species that I'm familiar with um, will be out of habitat. But um, I don't want to go, you know, and I could do a whole dissertation about marshes, but this is not a place to do it. Um, listen, that's where I grew up, Kelly. Where, where did you grow up? Delaware? Anyway. There are so many fiddlers around brackish waters. Is that a shop on St. Clark? Across James, West Virginia. Okay. They come out and walk up to you. Yeah, they're cute. I mean, if you love hermit crabs, you would love fiddler crabs, too. They're extremely cute. 
Um, so, Stacey, is there an increase in creditors that might be impacting the use of the shelves? That would be creditors on snails, yeah? Or creditors on fiddler crabs. Um, that's the bird whistling sweet Georgia Brown. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, anyway, so she's, she's not going to destroy the house, but she may still make noise. Um, so I don't know about an increase in predators. I think, um, and I don't know, Stacy, you'll have to say where are you talking about. Um, where predators that might be impacting the use of shells? Stacy, are you there? Come Answer me. I, I kind of just meant um, in general, are there more predators either on the snails, making more shells available, or more predators after the fiddler crabs and they're, they're needing more places to hide? I, I don't know. I don't know, but I'm, I'm hoping my former grad student who is on the faculty at a university in Georgia might want to, with her students, do a follow-up and look into some of this stuff. Okay, we have another parrot comment. Oh, Althea has a parrot, too. Okay. Um, Shane, when I was in New York, people were gathering students by the bucket full. Um, I'm wondering, were they use, going to use them for bait? Because uh, they're, they're, they're fun to keep, you know. If you're interested in land hermit crabs, you could maybe get interested in fiddlers too. Uh, thing that takes, I'm thinking of using marsh space, I guess, out the he's talking about. Uh, the countries that are documenting species expanding their range of response. Yes, they're moving north. Definitely, in most species, land, uh, everywhere, species are moving north, except in the southern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, species are moving south, moving toward the colder, toward the poles. Okay, Michael, for me. thank you. That makes perfect sense. I've heard from three different speakers this weekend from all over the world. Hermits seem to be showing up further north than usual. Okay, so that would be the land hermits that were pretty much in, in, in the U.S. and Florida. I guess they're moving up further north in Florida, perhaps into Georgia. The land hermit crib. Yeah. Okay, parrots, yeah. Yeah, land parrots, all right. Kelly, Southeast Virginia. Loss of habitat is relevant to all crabs. I would say certainly most crabs. Um, there are some crabs that live down in the deep sea. I guess that, and Sundar, could you shut up a bit? She decides to start singing while we're talking as well. Anyway, um, I, I'd say probably the crabs that are living down in the deepest deep sea haven't yet lost habitat. But crabs in areas that uh, are, are more affected by humans certainly are losing habitat for sure. Got a few more parrot comments. <laughs> Have I noticed any signaling or gesturing in land hermits similar to Philippe? I have not studied land hermits. I don't know, but I don't think other crabs, and certainly hermit crabs and fiddler crabs are very, very, very distantly related. Um, the enlarged claw, uh, I mean, a hermit crab has one large claw and one small claw, but that's true in males, right? And the fiddlers, it's just the male that has the enlarged claw, and the enlarged claw is waved. It's, it's a signal. It's used to attract females, and it's used to tell other males, go away, this is my 
my territory. I don't think hermits do that. I think they get one claw that's bigger for strength for, you know, crushing food rather than maybe our territory signals. Can you have those in the same tank as hermits, or would one harm each other? Well, you fillers need both water and, and you have to, to keep fillers happy. You want a tank that has a slope where they can get up out of the water and then also go back in the water, whereas a tank for, for full-grown hermits, you, you don't want that they don't want to be in the water. They need some for vapor and to drink, I suppose. But you, you, it's a different sort of tank. <laughs> I don't think she gives singing lessons. But thank you, Carrie, for favor. Um, bait and selling to Peshawar. Yeah, they do collect a lot of fillers as bait. Um, that's, that's common. Okay, Stacey, next we will give a parrot set. You know, when you want her to be vocal, she doesn't open her mouth. You know, people come to visit and they always your parrot do it, you know, and she will be totally quiet. So, uh, <laughs> it was probably a session where she would do nothing. Hermit crafts are most closely related to king crabs, yes. They're in a group, you can divide crabs up into two major groups, the brachiurans, the true crabs, and anomurans. Anomurans include hermit crabs and king crabs. The main difference easily noticed is that you look at the limbs of a breaking urine crab and it easily counts 10 limbs. I mean, it certainly hasn't lost one and everything like that. This side is a claw and four walking legs on each side. The atom urines haven't necessarily lost the, the, the back leg, but it's very, very small. In the case of the hermit crab, it's used for hanging on into the inside of the shell of the snail shell and in king crabs and, and there's another group i can't remember their names uh, it's just very reduced and not really used as a leg you can see this little thing but it's uh, not used as 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 a walking leg so you know if you look at it you count the legs and it looks like eight it's an animator if you look at it and it's 10, it's, it's a break ear. That's a simplification, but that's, that's the easy answer. All right, Paris, we got more Paris comments. <laughs> right. Yes, there are Paris are kind of like a two-year-old kid um, that hasn't been toilet trained yet. I guess we're done with the questions. I have enjoyed your questions, everybody. And I don't know if you have another session to go to. If you've got more questions or comments, do we know how land hermits modify their shells? It wasn't that they just chip away the shell, but I've read they use a secretion to get this done. Uh, that's all that I heard of, too. I, I, uh, um, less an expert on hermit crabs than all of you. Uh, I was very impressed last year by the uh, amount of knowledge that that the people at this conference have uh, who aren't trained scientists. And I was excited that some of you who have stuff and just sort of by trial and error should try to team up with some trained crabs biologists and get some of your work published into the scientific literature because some of the stuff that I saw last last year at this conference was amazingly wonderful. So um, I have, have been fascinated with an animal and watching it and seeing what they're doing. Um, you can contribute to the scientific literature. Uh, 
So anyway, that's my pitch to you all. So modify the shells, I don't know more than that they, you know, way at the edge, that's all. Um, all right, thank you, thank you. And um, crustacean plantation is done. Okay, so I guess you all want to go to the next session. And um, Stacy and Mary have my email if anybody wants to talk to me and write to me afterwards. Feel free to get in touch. Um, okay, so you're now talking about the next session. So thank you for your thank yous. I'm glad you enjoyed this. Something to think about. And uh, I enjoyed all of your questions. And um, enjoy the rest of your meeting.